I think all of us can probably relate to doing something dumb or even cruel to somebody else and having that kind of haunt us. The feeling that that sort of guilt would bring on, I imagine, would be a kind of numb, distant, haunting feeling, which is exactly how the music sounds for this whole film. The music captures it perfectly, and it sets up this ambient and, and terrifyingly claustrophobic atmosphere. The atmosphere of this movie is just spectacularly done. It's consistent throughout. It locks you in. It grabs you from the opening scene where we have these surges of feedback and this this piano going. Almost all of the music in this movie is piano and the occasional uh, kind of music box type noise over top and maybe the very rare other things. There's only one song in this whole soundtrack that stands out to me as being more a beat. And even that song is still piano. Uh, so it shows a ton of restraint on part of the composer and on part of the creators that they managed to lock themselves into this mentality throughout the whole film of we're going to create something that feels claustrophobic and numb and they do that through all these things they do that through the subtlety the, the, the soundtrack sets up the subtle tone everything in the movie is built for subtlety the voice acting the characters expressions the direction I mean, the direction can be quite in your face with how stylistic it is, but that style it embodies is very subtle. It's meant to feel a little bit off, a little bit strange. Some of the shots are framed in a different way where you have the character facing in a direction where normally uh, it would show empty space in the direction they're facing, but instead they place them on maybe the left side of the screen when they're looking in that direction. And now it has more of a tight feeling. It feels more, you can't see as much. It feels more claustrophobic. All in all, the movie feels more grounded because of this, which for many makes it better than the manga in and of itself. The whole movie, from just the subtle camera angles to the shot composition, is made to make you feel a little bit anxious. While the manga is built to be kind of a, an in-your-face emotional explosion, and both of those things are interesting, and in many ways I preferred the emotional explosion, but at the same time, when I was watching this movie through the first time, the thing that really stuck out to me is, wow, they went for a different tone here. And they really stuck with that tone, and that's fantastic. One of the best examples of this subtlety and of the direction is in the scene where Shoya's mom is confronting him about his attempted suicide or his thoughts of suicide. And the imagery that we see here is just fantastic. And the way that it shows her bleeding ear while she says, are you even listening to me? It's just very powerful doesn't necessarily have a deeper meaning than that but there's a punch to it there's an impact because he hasn't been listening he hasn't ever been listening to anybody he hasn't been following anything and this is the point when he's really going to start trying to change i mean he's been trying to change of course earlier but this is really the turning point in the uh you know kind of bridging the first and second acts of the film and that's so important and they just did a great job of giving it that weight and that impact but one <laughs> one thing with this scene is Poor Maria must be wondering what the hell is going on here. I mean, there's people yelling about suicide in front of her, and she's just this little adorable blob. As usual with KyoAni, there are many moments like this where all the pieces of the movie come together in just the right way. Like when Shoya covers his ears and the music has a metallic swell and becomes more distant, which is one of the most important visual motifs of the whole film. I mean, I don't know if you can call it a motif if it only really occurs twice, but I'm going to call it that. So... It is. It's very important, and they gave it just the right amount of weight. There's also these shots, again, that are a bit different. They're perspective shots, but they're arranged in such a way that you get a sense of the character's head you're inside. It's not just so that you can see what they're seeing. It's that you see it how they're seeing it. Like when he's looking at, the, at, at Kawhi or whatever her name is, and the camera's out of focus, it's kind of breaking the rule of thirds. And that's brilliant, because it feels wrong. It's wrong for him. He's not looking at her. He doesn't look at people's eyes when he talks to them. He doesn't look up at their faces. He looks down and away from them because he doesn't want to talk to them. He's afraid. This movie does a phenomenal job, just a phenomenal job of showing social anxiety and how much that it can affect a person. And for people who have struggled with social anxiety, I'm sure that this movie just resonated with them very deeply and probably more deeply than the manga did because... I can't think of... The manga did a great job in its construction, in its setup, in its... In the way it ordered its events, its structure was built around this anxiety being important, and it really hit because of the structure. But if I'm being honest, the presentation of it 
was not nearly as strong because you couldn't have the audio playing, you couldn't have the soundtrack going, you couldn't have, um, it didn't have quite the same types of shot compositions. Tomohiro is better in the movie than he was in the manga, uh, hands down. Having the comedic timing that they have, the, just the way he moves his little quirks, the way he speaks, it all lines up so perfectly, the way he's animated, it's fantastic. He has so much more character. The movie also handles Yuzuru really well, with her semi-monotone, tough guy voice, her blank stare, and how it just is just staring at Shoya, like she wants to punch him in the face whenever he appears to talk to Shoko with, towards uh, more of the beginning of the film. Their interactions really do bring a lot of light to who Shoya is and who he has become and the way that others are going to constantly judge him for what he's done in the past and how hard it's going to be to change. And that's not unreasonable of her, it makes sense for her character to be wary of him and as they grow closer it really helps bring home that Shoya is growing. And it's also the user is growing because she's going, okay, well people do change, people do get better, people improve. And just the way that they interact and the way that it shows how selfless he's become, in a dumb way, not a good way. He'll hold the umbrella out over her before he'll hold it over himself. He won't act angry when he realizes that she's the one who put up his picture online of him jumping off the bridge. He calls himself a horrible human being to her, all fairly frequently, and the way he apologizes after being slapped by her mom for no good reason. Then there's the eyebrow guy who I would say I was the most disappointed with as far as his characterization is concerned. Uh, Satoshi, his name was. By nature of them cutting out the movie subplot, most of his stuff is gone. But he is still in the movie. And his disdain for bullies is still shown enough that it can affect Shoya. So I understand why they kept him in, because they kept that part in. They kept it in where he says that he hates bullies, that he can't stand people like that. And it still works as far as Shoya's mindset, where now he's nervous and afraid in it and it speeds up the breaking down of the relationships. Without him in there, that wouldn't really happen. And then there's, uh, yeah, there's Ueno. And they did, yeah, they did a good job making her about as hateable as possible. Everything about her embodied obnoxious people from middle school, high school, just everything about her, they got that perfectly, but I could not stand her in any simple way at all. By the end of the manga, at least there was some sort of redeeming factor to her, I guess, but in this, she is just horrible and childish but I respect that because they need her here to serve as a counterpoint to Shoya because having her here where she hasn't really changed shows how hard it is for him to change and show that it's not just an automatic change he needs to work at it he needs to grow he needs to build himself back up and if he gives up he's like her he's gonna be like her again all these friendships are really used for the purpose of showing Shoya's mentality it's not about the group of friends in the movie. It's about Shoya's reaction to having a group of friends and how he looks a little bit unsettled, how he's not sure all the time of how to interact with these people and how he'll even eventually snap and lash out at them. Because the social anxiety doesn't just turn off as soon as, soon as good things start to happen to him. It's, it's there. It's a process. He has to get used to it. He has to get used to being vulnerable with other people, with telling them. And by the end of the movie, he is. By the end of the movie, he's not just putting on this false facade like he does with Shoko all the time throughout the movie where he's trying to be more excited than he is so that she'll feel better about herself. He actually engages in a dialogue and goes, these are my problems. I don't fit in at school. I have a lot of trouble with other people. They scare me. And she can listen and there, there's this dialogue. They're listening to each other. They're talking about their problems to each other. And if anything, that's the big point in the movie is that you shouldn't ever stop in a respectful way telling other people about how you feel and what's wrong in your life right because that's the problem here everybody's obsessed with other people's problems and they just won't listen they just say i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry like shoko and that's her biggest fault is that she's always saying i'm sorry the best two scenes in the whole movie and they connect very deeply is when Shoko has the notebook full of mean things people have wrote, written about her from elementary school, maybe even from more current schooling experiences, I'm not sure. And Shoya tries to take that from her and say, no, you don't need to look at this, don't look at it anymore. But she, it ends up getting dropped into the river and she jumps off and he kind of 
shouts her name, which is just an exact mirror of what's going to happen later when she jumps off the balcony and he runs over and he does grab her and he saves her and he ends up falling. So it shows how she's constantly thinking about this, how she's constantly going after these negative things people have said and she's just focusing on that. She, she hates herself. She's sorry. She's sorry that she inconveniences people, that she always upsets them. And it doesn't seem like with her there's been much thought of how that, how that can stop. It's just been an accepted thing of this is how I am. So she's always jumping after it. She's always going after that thought in her life and that's what controls her. Um, an hour and 47 minutes in about is when Shoko starts listening. She's listening to what her friend is saying to her. She's listening. And she doesn't just say, I'm sorry, this is my fault. And this is even after. This is kind of her fault. I mean, she tried to kill herself. But she doesn't say that. Instead, she says, everybody can change. You can keep on changing. We'll do better. We'll do better. And finally, we have Shoya uncovering his ears. And opening up to the world and listening. And I don't know if there could be a more obvious way of showing this through a visual motif. But it's a good one. Towards the beginning of the film, he's covering his ears, and at the end, he's uncovering them so that he can face the world ahead of him. Thank you for watching this the whole way through, however long this video may be. You can join, if you want to subscribe, you can join about a hundred other people or so <laughs> for any other videos that come out. So I'll be around for another video. Hopefully it won't take about a month and a half to make. Bye-bye.